always think whoever that is is either they're old as dirt or they can't keep a job. I mean, I mean, it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing to hear that. When you get older, they start reading all the places you've worked. You think, oh, shoot, you're unstable. Uh, now, uh, I want to say something right up front. I'm a Southerner. That's correct. You know, that part of the nation that's just east of here. Now, let me explain something to you. I love Texas. I love Texas. And a lot of y'all came from the South after the Civil War. I realize that. <laughs> but there are only four Southern states. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina. <laughs> and that is it. That is it. The rest of them are just pretenders, I'm telling you. And when I go up and work in Virginia, I tell them right off, I say, don't you be thinking you're Southern. Yeah, you're too close to Washington, D.C. to be Southern. <laughs> yes. Now, here's what I want to tell you. You have come here from all over this state, dragged yourself here, you natty bones in here this morning, and uh, you got up early looking good. But I want to tell you something. I've been in these meetings my whole life, you know, trying to get my CEUs and trying to show up and learn a little something. and. I used to walk in the door and I think I'm going to die right in this place. I am going to be so bored. I will die right here in this place. I will die in this chair. They won't find me for three days, you know, and everybody else will just step over me going to the break. I mean, I'll just die. Stab me. Just stab me. I can't stand it. You know, and you can't leave your road with somebody. That's part of it. <laughs> and the other part is, you know, you, so for a lot of you, you supervisors here. And so you are stuck in this room. I mean, you are stuck with me. So I'm going to make you a promise. You may not learn one thing, but you're not going to be bored, okay? <laughs> that is the best I can do for you today. That's it. That's my gift. Now, I, I want to tell you, I've been traveling since I saw you all over this country. I work a lot. <clears throat> Let's see, I work a lot up there, what they call New England. Now, I know you haven't thought about that since you were in the ninth grade, but it's still, it is still up there. Those little states up there in the Northeast, those little tiny states like Rhode Island and Connecticut and Vermont and New Hampshire, those little bitty states, they, Massachusetts, they're still up there. I just want to tell you, I go up there all the time. And every, every time I go, I think, you know, they all do away with these states. <laughs> You shouldn't have a state you see across. <laughs> right. That's right, isn't it? But y'all, let me tell you, they're so uppity. They are so uppity, 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 uppity. And when I go up there, you know, they all are so smart, and, uh, and they all got that sphincter muscle drawn up under their chin like that. You know, and they're so serious. And, uh, you know, part of me just won't say, boo. <laughs> you know? Give a life. Give a life. Well, I'm out there in, in what they call Worcester, 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 Massachusetts. I'm out there, Worcester. And I stand up that day. This is a bunch of docs and nurses, health people. I stand up that day. I thought I looked so good. I had on a red jacket. It's out there west of Boston. And I stand up and I look out the audience. They all have on black and white. They still think they're pilgrims. <laughs> I, I am serious. They've got everything going with the hat. You know what I'm talking about like this? And, and when I go, I like you, I know you think about this when you travel outside Texas. When I go up there, I always think, now, am I going to change how I talk or not? You know, that's a big question. Because I can do it if I try it. I can say walking, talking. How do you like that? Thinking. But my jaws would be tired by dark, you know? And it's hot. It's hot in the South. And why would I want to waste my energy on that? We just slide around, don't we? All of us. And I love being in Texas where I don't have to worry about this accent. I mean, the way you say I'm pushing me to shame. I, I, mean, I don't know where y'all where got yours, but you got a good one. And I, and I just love being here. I just relax. I can just relax. I don't have to think about it. But here's what I'm going to tell you about your accent and mine. It's a gift. It'll open doors. I can walk up to the airline counter in New York City any day of the week. 
and walk up there to LaGuardia, one of those places, and I'll say, y'all hit me. <laughs> y'all hit me, I'm pitiful, hit me. And they, they'll just come over that counter, I mean. And the thing that amazes me is they want to go home with me. What is that about? You know, they're always trying to crawl in the show and come down here. It's crazy. Feels good. Jumps on them, you know, like that. So when I come out here, I can just, oh, my, it's so grand to be back and just be with people that, that feel good to me. And thank you for having me. It means so much to me. And in honor, in honor of our long relationship, I'm going to take a chance today and tell you how I got mixed up with families long time ago. Now, let me explain something. When you start talking about your own stuff, it's like pulling your clothes off in public. It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> and you may not respect me when it's over. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you how I got in this business. I think you deserve to know. You know how I got here. And I want you to think about how you got here what you're doing in this room. I went out to teach when I was 20 years old, 20. Now, the reason for that was I had borrowed every kind of money you could borrow. I'm taking a full load. I'm going summers and winters trying to get out so I can go to work, you know. And finally, I graduate in three years. I'm 20 years old. And the day I graduate, all those old loan people start sending me letters. You know, they, they know the day you graduate and they start wanting their money. So I got me a job teaching English. <laughs> English is my second language. <laughs> I got me a job teaching English in Decatur, Alabama. I'm 20 years old. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. Sending a 20-year-old out, turning them loose on 150 kids a day should be against the law. <laughs> I mean, it should be a felony. It should be a felony to turn somebody 20 years old loose on 150 kids a day when you don't know enough to get to the car. You know, much less be gomming around on people's lives all the time. I'm serious. It's a crime. So I'm up there, I'm teaching. Then after a little while, I got me a job in Nashville, Tennessee, teaching up there. I'm one of 700 new teachers that fall. And if you've ever taught, you know that when you're a new teacher, they find the meanest, nastiest place to put you. You know, they see you coming. And they say, we've got the place for you. All those old beat up tenured teachers have the good jobs. And so they took, you know, you're fresh meat. They say, we got the place for you. And they put me in this hardcore center city school. Half the kids I had had already been adjudicated delinquent. They were the wildest bunch of folks you have ever seen in your life. Now, here's the thing. About halfway through that year, it dawned on me that when I stood in front of that class of 30 students, there were 30 families there. I just couldn't see them. Finally hit me that these children were bringing their families to school every day. I just couldn't see them. And that those families were going to influence these children and their behavior and performance and, and my success. I just didn't realize that. It finally dawned on me, the second thing, and if I could come out there and write it on your arm, that every child grows up thinking the world is like his own family. You want to know why CASA matters? Now, I want you to think about what I said. I'm going to say it again. That every child grows up thinking the world is like his own family. And what, what makes this job so hard is that we are trying to change that. You are introducing something different into this child's life. It finally dawned on me that if you grow up in a family where it's violent, where you see your daddy take your mother against that wall and call her every vulgar name, where you are scared to lie down at night, where you don't know who will be there in the morning or if they'll be there in the afternoon when you come home from school. If you grow up in that chaos and that uncertainty and all this violence, that's what you think the world is like. If you grow up in a home where you're loved and where you're valued and where you can count on things and there's this, what I love to think about it with my grandson is there's this rhythm to life. 
there is a rhythm of what you can expect. And that rhythm gives you a sense of stability and you feel comfortable and you feel safe. If you grow up like that, that's what you think the world is like. And it just shocked me when it finally came to me that these children were all from families that I didn't know anything about. And that I was never going to be good at anything involving families till I understood more about families. And I realized that the only family that I understood at all, listen to me, the only family that I understood at all was my own. And you don't understand your own till you're about 40. <laughs> that uncle that you thought was in the army, You know what I mean. He's up there at Leavenworth up there in Kansas in that big old federal pen. But nobody told you that. You know, you drift along in your life till you're about 30 or 40 thinking that you've been growing up with the Waltons on mountain up there somewhere. And then you start finding out the dirt when you're about 40. It's shocking when you start finding it out. They start telling you stuff. And so we, I realize that the only family that I know very much about is my own. And that was just such a life-changing experience for me to realize that I had to learn more about families. I look out here at you and all of each one of you represents a family system that is different from everybody else in this room. So it was during the Vietnam War and my husband was sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Now Fort Bragg was the biggest post in the world. It was huge. And we got ready to leave Nashville and move to Carolina I've got to think about, I need to find out more about families. So what I decided to do is that I would become a social worker. Now, I didn't know what one was. <laughs> I'd read about it in a book, but I loved how it sounded. Social worker, fun at work. <laughs> Party time. Social worker. I thought, ooh, 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 I love that. I am a good time girl. I mean, I can work and have a good time. I am all over that. I am all over that. Social worker just rang in my ears. So when we got up to Fayetteville, North Carolina, I took a little card and I, ma I mailed it up to Raleigh, the capital, to tell him I wanted to take the state social worker one test. And on the appointed day, I went up to Raleigh and went in this little room, and they gave me this test. Now, y'all, I made 92.2, and I turned into one right on the spot. <laughs> it was a miracle! It was a miracle! I went in and teacher came out a social worker. Two hours, two hours later, I can feel the wisdom come down. I can feel the wisdom. You know, the, the fire, the fire came down on my shoulders. I could feel this wisdom. I have the answers to the mysteries of life. All of a sudden I realized, you know, that I've been given this wisdom and that there are families all over Carolina sitting on the porch waiting for me to show up. And there are families all over North Carolina waiting for me to show up and tell them how to raise their children. Because I have been anointed, I have been anointed and I have the great answers to the mysteries. I mean, I am wise. I mean, I am just so full of it, I could hardly stand it. I came out of that room. And I am on fire to get there. I am on fire because I am now being ordained a social worker. And I know what to do. I mean, I am just all over myself. I am, I, I'm full of myself. I'm full of it. I mean, I'm just in a terrible, I get it, y'all, this is the truth. I get in my car. And I'm driving that 45 miles back down to Fayetteville, North Carolina. I am 26 years old. Now, when you are 26, you fall into one of two categories. You're either dumb and you know it, or you are dumb and you don't know it. <laughs> and when you are dumb and you don't know it, you are a danger to yourself and others. I mean, but I am on a mission. I can just feel it. I am on a mission. I am on a mission. I'm on fire with the mission. And I get down there to Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I go to work for the Cumberland County Department of Public Welfare. 
that's back when they call it what it is, you know. Uh, we keep changing the name all over this country, you know. I don't know whether we're trying to fool the clients or what we're trying to do. I love that name you did have, the Texas State Department of Protective and Regulatory Services. Now, what in the world is that? You know, if you want to know who that is, ask a client. They know it's the welfare. Do you understand that? You can change the names all you want to. But back then, it was the welfare. And I went to work there. And my supervisor was a woman from Virginia. And when I walked in, she handed me the child welfare manual. Now you deserve to know this. It was a big black book about this thick. And on the front, it said volume one. <laughs> That's never good, y'all. That is not good. But this is the part that'll grab you. She handed me that book and she says, now you read this and you'll be ready. Now, if I'd had any sense, I'd said, for what? But I didn't. I said, you know it. I'm your person. I'm on the job. Give me that book. I'm, I'm ready to go. Give me that book. I'd do it. You know it. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Here's where I'm just telling you things I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> they gave me an office. I'd never had an office before with a door <laughs> and a desk and a phone. Now, I'll tell you something. First thing I did is I got a piece of paper and I took it like this and I folded it like this and I wrote Naomi Griffith on it and I set it right there on my desk. <laughs> a position. And the second thing I did is I called my mama Colette. And I said, your baby's got a position. Your baby's got a position. I'm a social worker. You know, come on, y'all. And then I opened that big black book up, started reading about child abuse and neglect, foster care, adoptions. It didn't take me long to realize that I didn't understand any of that. But I didn't tell you about it. I didn't tell anybody. You know, that first two or three years, you don't know Jack, but you don't tell anybody. And it is a real hard job when you're trying to be smart and you know you don't know anything, okay? You're always under a lot of pressure. And so, you know, when she'd come down the hall, I'd sit up and try to look real smart, you know? And because uh, I knew I didn't know. Takes a long time. Takes several years to get hold of this. You know, and I didn't know. I thought, oh, man, I'm all over this. Because I got the truth in my heart. Now, on the fourth day, June Davis came in and she said, Naomi, I think you're ready. <laughs> I said, you know it. You know it. I'm ready to go. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. I mean, I've been here four days. You know, the world has been deprived of my wisdom for four days. You know, you're sitting out there, you've had your training, you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Send me out, I'm ready to go. And I said, well, what you want me to do? I can handle it. She said, well, I want you to go out here on Bragg Boulevard and find the home of Emma Washington. And your job is tell her that her check is gonna be cut off. <laughs> she has been on welfare 24 years. Now, I'm so dumb that I don't understand the significance of that. And I said, consider it done. I'm on the job. I'm your person. I can do it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, hallelujah, I'm going to the field. Now, social workers talk about the field all the time. I didn't know what it was. They're always talking about going to the field, and I'd heard them, I'd heard them, and I thought, now I want to do that because they go out and they come back with a donut. <laughs> and I said, where are they going? I mean, I, that field, man, I'm all over the field. I mean, and I'm sitting there, she's talking to me, and I'm thinking, I'm going to the field, I'm going to the field, I'm going to the field, you know, I'm excited. Well, I get, I get in my little 1965 Malibu two-door hardtop. 
That's that car you get out of college you can't afford, but you look so good in it. You know what I mean? And I start down that four lane around Fort Bragg. It'd be like Fort Hood or, or uh, you know, uh, Fort Sam or anywhere around these posts. It's covered up in all these nasty, lascivious things you've ever seen in your life. I'm driving down through there looking. You know, they got, they got the go-go places. They got the pole dancing. They got the, they, they got the lap dancing. You know, and I'm looking and. And they had signs that I did not even understand. <laughs> now, I've been to Las Vegas now, and I know what that is, all right? If he says anything about wrestling, don't go in there. Don't go, uh-uh, 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 uh uh-uh. So I'm going down through there, and I, I finally find her house. She is living in this garage apartment by this go-go place. Now, this could be you. Do you understand me? I'm telling you, I'm t- sharing my heart here. I'm in the field. And I, I find her and she's in this garage apartment next to this go-go place. Now, y'all, I pull that little car right up to the steps. But before I get out, I reach and get the most important thing in a social worker's life, which is her legal pad. <laughs> this is the sign of our authority and power right here. <laughs> this is what makes little children run and cry. You know, you, you get out of the car and they say, Mama, Mama, it's a caseworker. That's how they know. This is powerful. And I had never had one. And I knew to be somebody, you had to have one. So I had slipped around there to the supply room and got me one. Now, when you start out, you get it naked like this. Naked. You know the difference between naked and naked. Don't act like you don't. And when you've been there about 10 years, they give you this old nasty cover. That's how you know you tenured workers. <laughs> like I did right here. But I'm telling you secrets. I'm telling you secrets. I'm telling you another secret. If you're going to have a legal pad, you got to know how to hold it. It goes right here over your left breast. And I want to tell you something. There's a little groove it fits into right here. There's a little tiny groove. And when you put it in that groove, it sits up there like that. And you pull yourself up. Now, let me tell you something, though. If you're going to use this, you will know when it's time to retire. for the groove and it's gone. You need to go home, okay? <laughs> now I go up those steps. I'm on my first home visit. Y'all all know about this. I go up those steps. I knock on the door. This woman in her 40s came to the door. I said, I am Naomi Griffith from the Cumberland County Department of Public Welfare. And she said, honey, come on in. Well, I stepped over in this little room, y'all. There was a sofa here. I hardly let my bottom touch that sofa good. I mean, I hardly got set down until I said, Ms. Washington, your check is going to be cut off. None of that building rapport. You know what I mean? None of that creating a relationship. You know where you sit down, make nice, then tell them why you're there? No. Went right to it. I said, your check is history, girl. It's gone. And when I said that, she said, you can't take my check. I can't work. I've had surgery. And she jumped out in the middle of the floor and took that dress and threw it up over her head. No underwear. Right in front of my face, I hear this. Ooh, that was me. Ooh. She was the first naked woman I'd ever seen in my whole living life. I had never seen a naked woman ever, 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 except myself. And, and you can't see yourself good. I'm telling you that right now. And you mean it's right in front of my face. My heart is pounding. My face is red, you know. And y'all, you don't know where to look. Where do you look? You know, I'd never seen a naked woman. Women don't do naked. We don't do naked. We do not do naked. We're all 
always looking for a restroom with doors on those suckers. And I can travel with three women in one hotel room for a week and never see anybody naked. And, and, and that's because we change our whole outfit under a T-shirt. Put your T-shirt on, take your clothes off, put your clothes on, pull the T-shirt off, ready to go. We don't know naked. When my daughter was 12 years old, I took, I took her in the bedroom and taught her the most important lesson in life for a girl. And that's how you take your bra off through your sleeve. I know you know. I see you doing it on Interstate 30 all the time. I see y'all out there. You know you think I'm dying. My blood is cut off. Get that thing off, boy. And that's all part of the fact we don't know nothing. We don't do nothing. It terrified me. I, if I'd been pregnant, it'd mark my baby. I'm telling you that right now. I had never seen a sight like that. But you'll be proud of me in that I, I couldn't speak. I'd been struck mute, you know, but I did the only honorable thing. I reached down and got my purse, and I went and got in the car. <laughs> I, didn't say that. I went back to that office, and I found that June Davis. And I said, listen here, girl. If this is what social work's about, I'm out of here. I can't look at that every day of my life. <laughs> and that's how I started in this business. Dumb as a box of rocks. You know, I thought I knew about families. I thought I knew about the world. But you know, you, everybody in this room understands that when you step outside yourself and you, to use a phrase I used here before, when you cross that porch, when you go into another world, when you step into somebody else's life, into the middle of a family, it is, it is a life-changing experience. And the reason why is that every family is different. And we start out and we think we know and we don't know. We all started out the same way in this room, dumb as a rock. But what happens is we are going with our hearts and we're hoping that our brains catch up. You know what I'm saying. And when I decided to, to really get into families and realize what an honor and a privilege it is to cross the porch to sit down with people and talk about things that really matter. Do you know there are very few people in this country that get to do that? How many people have been to your home to sit down and, and talk to you about things that really matter? This is an honor. This is a privilege to be able to step into someone else's world and to try to affect change for children. What an honor that is. Nobody else knows like you know. And I, I got to thinking about families. I have struggled with this my whole life. I'm standing up now. You know, I'm an old lady. I, I'm a grandmother. And I look back at my life and I realize now that I understand more about families than I did. But I will never understand families. It's not possible. Every one of them is different. Every one of them has its own flavor, its own personality. Every, listen. Every one of them has a different history, and you don't know what it is. And so we step into that world with our hearts, and we listen. I cannot tell you the power of listening, just listening and hearing with your heart and being able to look past what your eyes see. The Casa Volunteer takes the world into a different place. But I will tell you that you have to listen with your whole body. You have to listen with your heart. You have to listen. You, you cannot just depend on your eyes for what you see. Let me show you why. I am from a little old Mississippi family. I'm from a little town called Iuka, Mississippi, about this big. 
its only claim to fame is that it's where Bay Youth Drive get married. It's an elopement center. They don't care if you're 12, 13, makes no difference. <laughs> Cost a dollar. There's no waiting period, no blood test. You show up, you're married, girl. Quick. And the old man that married everybody owned the Texaco filling station. And during the week, during the week he married him out there on the grease rack. You know, where up that part in the old filling station where it says lubrication. That's where they used to do it. You couldn't make that up if you wanted to, okay? Now, that's the little town I'm from. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I'm from, this is important. I'm going through some items here. I'm from a family that had nothing. We didn't have two pennies to rub together. My daddy said, I love this phrase, that we didn't have cash money. Now, I realize that's redundant, cash money. But let me explain to you Texans. When you don't have cash, it's bad. And when you don't have money, it's bad. But if you don't have cash money, you're in a terrible shape. It's a whole nother level, I'm telling you right now. And the reason we didn't have cash money was because the economy was tied to cotton and we didn't have any cotton land. This is not complicated. And my daddy would go into the fields after the crops had been picked and he would pick up the scraps or they call that gleaning in the Bible. And he would pick up the scraps left and take it to town for the little money we had. We didn't have money. My mama put our stuff up in the summertime. We didn't buy stuff at the store. She said, we eat out of the garden, and she meant it. And I traveled this country, and I realized that somehow we have gotten the idea that if you're poor, you're sorry. And that is not true. And when you step out there in this world, and you cross that porch, I want you to remember that I have never worked with anybody that had less money than we did. But yet somehow we have gotten the idea that that is some sort of a stigma, that you, you're lazy. We didn't have any money because there was no money. And we put up that fruit jars all summer long in the house so that we had food to eat in the winter. And we didn't buy stuff at the store, except maybe meal and flour and sugar, coffee, Christmas maybe some cocoa, vanilla. Let me tell you something else. I want you to look past your eyes. My parents went to the seventh grade. By the world standards, they would be treated as stupid and ignorant. But my parents were smart. They just didn't get to go to school. There's a difference. There is a difference, and the jail is full of geniuses. They went to the seventh grade because the school only had seven grades. First bench was the first grade, second bench was the second grade. And when you finished seven benches, that was it. Or you had to go into town and pay room and board. My people couldn't do that. But we look at people and we think, well, they had, they're stupid and they're ignorant. They hadn't been to school. But my parents were smart. And they placed a high value on school. We talked about it all the time. It was the biggest thing you could talk about outside of going to church was about school. Let me tell you one other thing. We moved 17 times by the time I was in the fifth grade. I'd be a migrant child now. They'd have me in every chapter and verse you can have in school. Those federal programs, chapter one, two, three, four, and five, you know, for these pitiful little children that move all the time, they'd have me out down there. We lived in houses that weren't finished. We lived in houses that had, had no running water, no electricity. We had lived in houses, you could see the rafters up there. That, I mean, we lived in every kind of house. I never noticed that. Because who we were as a family moved from one place to another as my daddy tried to make a living. I never noticed where it was because I was safe in that house. I was safe there. So I go through and look at these things and realize that, that sometimes what we see with our eyes is just so misleading. It's what we have to feel with our hearts. We have to feel whether or not there are emotional ties between this parent and this child. That's all that matters. Is there a, a sense of caring and of emotional attachment that will keep this child safe? That's what matters. 
And until my mother died, I knew that I could go to a phone if I had a coin and call her and she would help me. She loved me. It had nothing to do with those things. Now, I will say this. I need to tell you something that they didn't tell you in the introduction. I don't know some of y'all, and you need to know this. This is more important than all those school stuff. Most important things about you are not on your resume. Seriously. The most important thing about me that you don't know is that I'm a menopause baby. I am a menopause. You heard it right. I am a menopause baby. A menopause baby is a baby born to a mother over 40. We're different. There are no rules for us. I have been handed down from heaven as a gift. I'm a gift that's been handed down. I mean, all I've ever had to do my whole life was just show up. That's it. I'm a gift. I'm a gift. You know, I don't understand rules. You know, your mom is too old to keep up with you. And she is giving up on those silly rules you have for your first children that make them miserable, like go outside and play, but don't get dirty. I mean, how dumb is that? All I've ever had to do is just show up. I'm a gift. I'm a gift. When I wrote my first book and I took it down there, I was so proud of it, showed my mama down in Alabama. Took it down there and she read it. Her only comment was this. She said, why'd you put that word menopause in that book? She said, you know we don't use those sexual terms. You were born late. I love that. Born late. And I got to think about when I was little, we'd be out somewhere and I'd get in a little tussle, a little scrape, and she'd say, oh, you know, Naomi, she's born late. <laughs> and everybody laughed. I didn't know what it meant, but it covered up a multitude of sins. I mean, I am free in this world. I am free. Now, I will say this. My mama had one rule that we all had to go by, even me. And that rule was you had to have a green vegetable every day. At night, she'd go around and ask you, have you had your green vegetable? And you better come up with it, girl, I'm telling you. I didn't know what happened to you. I thought you'd die. I'm something like that. So, and here's the thing I'm, I want to tell you. This, is, this little part of this is important. The only vegetable I really liked was spinach. Now, spinach does not grow in southern gardens. It's too hot. But I had had it at my aunt's house. She lived in town, and she bought her stuff at the store. And I'd had it in a can at her house. I loved it. My daddy, it was her, his sister, Virginia, he said she had a little, you know what I mean? Money. Money. You know, the, you know there's always part of your family's got a little. It's not you, obviously. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know, Virginia's got a little. Well, she bought her stuff at the store. So I'd had that spinach, and I loved it. It's Saturday. My mom and dad have gone to town to get those pitiful little groceries they always got. That flour, that meal, that sugar, that coffee. I'm sitting on the porch waiting on them to come home. And there they are. My mama's got that one little sack. I would follow behind her through the house. And she would set that sack up on the kitchen table and I would drag a chair up. I'm a little four or five year old girl. And I would drag that chair up as she pulled those items out of that bag. The meal, the flour. And the last thing she pulled out of that bag every week was a can of Del Monte spinach for me. There was not a word said. It was a gesture on her part that said, I thought about you. You, my baby. I know you like this. I got this for you. But those words were never said. Listen to me. The words were never said. And she would open up that can. And every night she would heat up a little bit. She'd go to that old ice box and get a little bit of that spinach and heat it up and put it on my plate. Nothing said. I don't care how long I live. I don't care what I do, I will never feel that important again, ever. Then when she would bring that plate over there with that little spoonful of spinach, 
Life changed. When it came time for me to start school, we're living in Sheffield, Alabama. Do you remember when you started school? In my family, it was the biggest thing in their life that could happen to you. And all summer long, my sisters taught me how to make my letters, and we talked about school, and Naomi's going to school. I still remember it. Naomi's going to school. Naomi's going to school. I guess they hoped it'd help me or something. <laughs> but, you know, Naomi's going to school, and I'm learning my letters. You know, we're living in Sheffield, Alabama. I'm going to Annapolis Avenue School. I can hardly wait. In August, in August, my mama pulled out an old Singer sewing machine. Not the kind you plug in the wall. But that wouldn't have helped us. Uh, but the kind that had a treadle like this. And she, she had saved up some old sacks and remnants and stuff. And she made me five little school dresses, y'all. Five little school dresses. All by the same pattern. I think it was Simplicity 1216. But I'm not sure you're going to recognize it. It had a little Peter Pan collar. It came around here. Had three little buttons here in the front. They didn't button anything. They were for show. And then you had these little gathered up s sleeves. And if you ironed them just right, they'd stand up like that. And then there were two pockets on the front and a sash that tied in the back. Five of them. I thought, whatever this is, this is big. I mean, this is really, really big. Five brand new dresses. And she took me to Florence, Alabama, and she bought me a pair of Girl Scout shoes. Now, Girl Scout shoes were these big old brown Oxfords, lace-up Oxfords, made out of iron. <laughs> the only way you could get shut up was to die or outgrow them. There was no other way. We'd sit on the curb and beat them on the curb. You could not tear them up. You could not tear them up. They were ugly, but they would not tear up. And then she put, oh, you're going to love this. She put my hair in pigtails. Now, I know some of y'all living here in Austin, Dallas. All you, the, you people out here got, you know, got that, got a little up and all that. You call them braids. But I know a pigtail when I see one, okay? <laughs> and let me tell you what you do. You take a comb and you run it down the middle of your head right here. And you make this big white line if you're a little white kid. You make this big old white line down the middle of your head and you pull the hair over on each side. It's a thing of beauty, that line right down your head. And you pull the hair over on each side and you plait them into these plaits and you tie a bow on the end of each one. And you know when you've got it tight enough because your eyes pull. <laughs> you say, Mother, Mother, I can't see. you got them too tight. you got them too tight. And there I am, and I go off to Annapolis Avenue School. I want you to think about me. Here I am. Every disadvantage there is. I just don't know it. Kate, it's not what you see. It's what you feel that matters. I thought I was a gift. My mama said so. I thought I was beautiful. My mama said so. I get up to that school. I mean, my teacher came out to meet me. Do you remember your first grade teacher? And uh, she, her name was Ms. Hovatter, and she came out to meet me, and she said, Naomi, this is true. We've been waiting on you. I thought, that's odd. We hadn't been here but a week. And see what I knew. I didn't know till ten, 10 years ago that the day before I went to that school, my mother had been up there. My mother that I'm sure took everything she had to go. But she had been to that school to tell them that her baby was coming. Ms. Hovater took me in that classroom. All these little kids that lived in town. We had these little double desks. They were bolted to the floor. And she put me in the desk. There was a little girl on this side already. Her name was Mary Jenny Curry. You know, we love those double names in the South. <laughs> Mary Jenny, Mary Jenny Curry, Mary Jenny. We love that Bubba and, you know, Peggy Sue and Bobby Joe. I mean, we're all over those double names. 
Now, I still know her. She lives in Montgomery, Alabama. She has been the head of parents as teachers, but now she's Jennifer. And when I see her at a meeting in Montgomery, I see her coming the door like back there. I'll say, hey, man, Jenny. <laughs> hey, you girl. <laughs> so she knows I know where she came from and that she was just as ugly as I was in the first grade, okay? <laughs> well, I sat down in that little seat. I didn't sit there five minutes till I went, you did the thing I've done my whole life. I got up and I went around and interviewed everybody in the room. I should have known I was going to be a social worker that day. I mean, I went around. I said, who are you? Where do you live? Who's your mama? You got a dog? <laughs> well, after about 10 minutes, Ms. Hovatter's tired of that. And she came over and got me, and she put me up next to her and put her arm around me and gave me a hug and told me she loved me. And she put me in the cloakroom. <laughs> now, the cloakroom was this little skinny hall-like room behind the teacher. It ran down... Like this, had a door over here and a door over here, and it was long and skinny, that little room. And it had hooks in there. And when you come in in the morning, you would hang up your coat, and if you brought your lunch, you put your lunch in there. Now, this is important. We didn't have anything. We didn't have any money. We, we moved all the time. My parents hadn't been to school, but listen to me. When she put me in that cloak room, it did not hurt my feelings. I thought I'd been singled out for an honor. <laughs> I'm serious. I went right on in that cloakroom. Matter of fact, I spent most of the first grade in that cloakroom. I spent my first grade in the cloakroom singing to myself and going through people's lunches. <laughs> I mean, it was wonderful. Pale wax paper taking it apart, you know? About 11 o'clock, she came in there and got me. She said, uh, uh, she put me in my seat, and she said, we're getting ready to go to lunch. I thought, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I'd never been out to eat in my life. I'm so excited, I'd hardly stand. She said, we're going to the lunchroom, but I want to tell you something. When we get there, you got to eat everything on your plate, or they won't let you out of there. And they have an old lady that stands by the door named Miss Solomon, and she checks your plate. Boy, I'm all over myself because we're going out to eat. We're going downstairs. We're going out to eat. We've never been out to eat. I'm just beside myself. We get down there, and I step up to that table, y'all. And that woman behind the table hands me my plate. And on that plate is a wad of English peas as big as my fist. Green pea things. Those nasty round things in that old green so soupy stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Those old nasty green peas. Now, I'm not talking about those little ones that you buy, a bird's eye or something like that. I'm talking about these big suckers. They about this big. They've been keeping them in a cave up in Colorado <laughs> in the commodity program, and they pull them out and feed them to poor little children across America. The outside is hard, and the inside is mush, and when you bite down on them, they explode in your mouth like that. And that old green, slimy, grainy stuff gets up in the roof of your mouth and between your teeth. I'm not eating that. You hear me? I am not eating that. I have never eaten that. I will never eat that. I cannot stand to think about eating that. I will not do it. I never have, but let me tell you something. I've got a problem. They said you had to clean your plate or you couldn't get out of there. Those are the two choices they gave me. Now, what we're looking for for children is the ability to think and make good decisions. We talk about it all the time. They gave me two choices. Now, let me explain something to all you adults in this room. I'm when you're six years old. This is big. I'm going to tell you for sure I'm not eating those peas. And I'm going to tell you for sure I'm going home. I am going home. Do you get that? And so I am standing there, in that, and I'm a little old country girl. I'm from nothing. They gave me two choices. Neither one of them is acceptable. Now, here's the deal with y'all. Everybody in here is smart. Everybody in here is special. And one of the reasons you got here and you're a successful adult is that you know how to make choices. You know how when you're given certain situations, 
that you know how to make good choices. And if they don't give you a good choice, you will find one. I'm serious. That's what maturity is. That's what wisdom is. That's what we want for our children. We want them to be given the chance to learn and grow and make good decisions. This comes out of a caring home. Now I'm standing there. I've got all kinds of possibilities. I can take that plate and throw it at that lady. That's one possibility. I can lie down on the floor and beat my head. That's another one. But for a little old girl from my Yucca, Mississippi, brought up down there in that red clay with a daddy that worked so hard and my mama who worked so hard and a family that loved me, this was a no-brainer. I took that plate and I walked over to that table and I set that plate down on that table and I reached up and got those peas and put them in my pocket. Now this is what we want. I'm serious. This is what we want families to teach and to give permission for. Now I will say this, that old green pea juice ran down the, the it ran down the front of my dress and it pulled up in the hem and you could mash the hem and it's whoosh, that was good. Well, I went over to that old woman by the door, Miss Solomon, I showed her my plate and she let me out. And I went out on the playground and I pulled up a rock and then I dug those peas out and I put them on that rock. I fixed it. Problem solved. You know, being given these gifts to know that I can think I'm special. Now when three o'clock came, it's time to go home. I'm riding the bus out to where we live. And my dress is dried in the front and stiff. And it's got, it's got a green haze kind of on this side. And I get home and my mom was waiting on me. She's sitting inside there and I, I go in the house and, and she leans out and she says, well, what happened to you? I said, we had peas. That's all that was ever said. There was no great discussion. There was no parenting moment. I mean, she knew me inside and out. She knew how I looked at the world. She knew me as a person. She knew how I thought. That's what I'm talking about. When we step into people's lives, into families, we've got to look at things like that. We have to look past our eyes. We have to be able to feel what's going on here between this parent and this child. My mother knew me as a person. She knew how I thought. And I'll tell you what else she knew. She knew I was not eating the peas and she knew I was coming home. And, and from then on, when I would go home in that shape, she would lean out and say, well, I see you had peas today. And life went on. You know, from the outside, from the outside, I would be called a, a disadvantaged child. I would be called a child with all these risk factors. I, 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 I just don't understand that. My mother lived to be 100 years old. She was born January 1st of 1900. She lived a whole century. Think of that. I told her she had to. I said, you brought me here late and you're going to step up. Now, come on, girl. I did, really. I told her that all the time, get out of that bed, get on this walker, come on here now. She's the oldest person that's ever been in Health South Rehab. I'm telling you, 97 years old, get up, get up. I need you, get up. I want you to go with me one of the last trips down to Alabama and you'll understand all about what I'm talking about, about this connection about this emotional connection I'm looking for between parents and children that will keep them safe. I live in Nashville. For a long time, every weekend, I drive down to North Alabama to see her. Not, not for her, for me, for me. There's a difference. One of the last times I went, I got down there. She's still lying in there asleep or taking a nap or resting. I went straight in the bedroom where she was. And I crawled up in the bed next beside her and pulled that sheet up over me. 
I want you to think about how it would feel to crawl up in the bed next to your 97-year-old mama. Smell that smell, that's your mother. Hear her heartbeat. I've got my head on the pillow right by hers. And we're lying there together. It's so quiet. And I said, Mother, there's something I need to ask you. And she said, well, what is it, baby? I said, it goes back a long time. She said, it's okay, tell me. I said, Mother, why'd you cook that spinach for me every night? Just like it hadn't been 50 years. And the voice from the other side of the pillow said, I didn't see any sense in making you miserable over that. I didn't see any sense in making you miserable. She had this feeling for me. It tied us together. She cared how I felt. She knew how I felt. When I was happy, she was happy. When I was sad, she was sad. We call it empathy. It's the ability to feel what another person feels through your skin. You can feel their pain. You can feel their joy. That's the thing that makes children safe. It's not the law. It's not the court. It's the fact that this parent can feel the pain of this child. And when you cross that porch and you go into that home, that's what I want you to be watching for. Does this parent feel for this child? Does she feel his pain? Because we know that if she feels his pain, there will not be abuse. It hurts too bad. I'm counting on you because all those years that I was in child welfare, we looked at all the extraneous things. We looked at the physical things. I didn't know enough to look for what I'd had in my own life. Someone who was always looking out for me, who did not want me to be hurt, who could feel the pain I have. So you're going out there as that independent voice, but you're going out there as a heart. I'm more interested in your heart that goes out there and feels what you feel in that home and takes that back. That's what makes this program so special. I want to share this to show you how I feel about CASA. I have I have spoken to Casa so many times. I love this concept of someone who is truly an independent voice, who takes another family in, who takes an agenda that's totally different and looks at this family with your heart. That is so important to me. When I was four years old, we moved back to Iuka, Mississippi. We'd been living up and down the Tennessee River. My dad had been trying to make a living, work, working here and there. And, we moved back to Iuka, and we didn't have a place to stay, so my daddy said, we'll move in Aunt Tinny's house. My old Aunt Tinny had died the year before, way up in her 90s, and she had this little four-room clabbered house out there from Iuka. Had no running water, no electricity, way out there in the country on the old gravel road. And we moved out there in the fall of the year. In the fall of the year in Mississippi, you have these really warm days and these cool, cold nights. And my daddy would get up in the morning and he'd build a big fire in that little house, but we couldn't have a fire at night. It was too dangerous. That was just like a tinderbox there. So he would let the, the big, we had a big old heater, warm morning heater, and he would let that, that fire burn down. And at night, the house would get cold. And you could feel the cold coming in. If you've ever been in a house like that, you know, when the fire goes down, it takes a while, but you can feel the cold coming in. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm a little 4 or 5-year-old girl, and I would wake up, and you remember when you would wake up and you were little and you didn't know what was wrong, you just kind of unch around, you know you're not, where something is, and finally I'd get awake enough and I'd say, Mother, I'm cold! <laughs> and I would hear her footsteps hit that floor. I'd hear her, I mean immediately, her footsteps hit that floor. 
And I knew she was coming back across those old one bay boards. We didn't have any rugs, things like that. And I'd hear those footsteps coming, and my heart would just lift up because I knew across her arms would be an old patchwork quilt made out of the dresses my sisters and I had worn. And she's coming. She's coming. It's cold. It's two o'clock. I'm scared. I'm cold. And she's coming. And I hear the footsteps. And she would come to the end of that bed and take the corners of that quilt and she would snap that quilt out over the bed. And it would snap and the air would whoosh down and it would settle down. You know that feeling. And she'd say, now you'll feel better. Now, I felt better because I had the quilt, but what I really felt good about was that she came. She came. I heard footsteps. I heard footsteps. In this world, it's about footsteps. Somebody who cares for you, who gets up when they don't want to, who takes care of you when you're sick, it's footsteps. And when I think about Casa, I can see you carrying the quilt. You are carrying the quilt for children in this state better than anybody else I know. You are carrying the quilt. You snap it, it settles, and you're there. You're part of the footsteps. This is important. Thank you so much.